Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, fresh review, remember that verses 8 through 10 we discussed that it is about Jesus Christ when he ascended up to heaven, but he went down to the underworld to free the Old Testament saints. And then he, when he freed the Old Testament saints, he went back up to heaven. When he went back up to heaven, when he ascended, it was done so that he might fill up all the universe itself. And you might remember that I taught you that his blood is spread throughout all the entire universe. Amen. Which is why you have access to his blood anytime, any place, anywhere. You have access to his throne in glory anytime, any place, anywhere. Amen. And if everything in the universe is connected, you have access to, then that means through your prayer life, you literally have power to bend the laws of nature, time, matter, energy, and space. I really believe that. Amen. You might say, why? Because all of that is under your control and dominion. God gave them to Christ and Christ gave them to you, as we've discussed at Ephesians chapter 1 and chapter 2. So Ephesians 4 is repeating that idea. So literally, prayer is the most important thing ever that you have in your life. That is the closest thing that you will get into uh, direct healing and resurrection of the dead that the apostles had back then. The closest power that you'll ever reach to that is the power of prayer. So may, never take prayer lightly. You have great power through that. It is the power where you ask God to meet your financial needs, to heal the sick, for God to rescue you from a crisis, to provide a miracle, for something you're requesting in your past or in your present or in your future that you want the Lord to handle. So a lot of things, a lot of things. Now let's look at verse 11, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And he gave some, okay, what is he giving? He's giving, remember the context is verse 8 through 10. Remember at the context of verses 8 through 10, the Lord Jesus Christ, up from his throne in glory, as he ascended, was taking gifts with him. So with the gifts that he has, which was all achieved at the cross of Calvary, he now provides these gifts to you. And you're like, what are the gifts? So some of the gifts that we would think about is, for example, skills and talents that we would use for the Savior. And yes, that is very true. A lot of the things in type uh, come, the skills and the talents, they come from the gifts that Christ achieved from Calvary, his death, burial, and resurrection. However, in this particular passage, at Ephesians chapter 4, that is not the case. In Ephesians chapter 4, the gifts that it's going to be covering is not things, it's people. Notice, and he gave some, that's referring to the gifts by context at verse 8. What is it? Notice people, it's not things, apostles. So we know about the 12 apostles, including the apostle Paul. The Lord gave that, remember, he's giving gifts to his body, the church. So the church, which is his body, receives the gifts, and the church receives apostles. That's what the Lord gave to the church back then. Now, obviously, apostles are not available anymore. They pretty much died out, because look at the order here. This is pretty interesting how Ephesians go by the order. It goes with apostles first, that happened at the first era of the church, and some prophets. Some other gifts that he gave at the early era of the church was prophets. The New Testament church, they did have prophets that time. Even the evangelist Philip, his daughters, they prophesied. So men and women were prophesying to the Lord. But then notice after that, and some evangelists. So afterwards, the, what the Lord gave some to be evangelists. Evangelists, what they are is that these people are preachers. So these people preach 
Now, if we were to... And they spread throughout the world when they preach. That's what evangelists are. They travel from place to place to preach. Now, if we were to think about a time era where, where there was preach and spread abroad everywhere, think about the Waldensians. The Waldensians, they were a ragged bunch of group who didn't have an official organization. And the Lollards as well, they were just street preaching. And the Catholic Church was just chasing them like flies and killing them. But Waldensians, because they didn't have the complete Bible in their hands, they practically memorized chapters and chapters and books of the Bible, and they would quote scripture. So when they died, some of them would just uh, carry the scriptures with them when they were burnt alive at the stakes. They hid the word of God in their hearts. So these people, they were preaching abroad everywhere. Think about Luther. Think about uh, the Great Awakening revivals. During that time, Jonathan Edwards, we know about John Wesley, etc. They were preach, there was preaching everywhere, spread abroad through England, America, and even during the Reformation, during the darkness of Europe that time. So preaching was everywhere. There was evangelism. Think about the first missions that started. Started with William Carey. And then Adoniram Judson became the father of American missions himself. And then other missionaries became involved. Missionaries were going to pagan countries and pagans were getting converted. I mean, you got Hindus converting, Buddhists converting, cannibals converting. I mean, it was quite a testimony. Some of you have heard me teach uh, uh, church history, mm -hmm. the church history class, uh, the history of Bible believers. Mm -hmm. And I try to make that a yearly thing because that is such a blessed story. It gets yeah. you pumped up hearing about all these preachers spreading abroad. I mean, you got to realize during that time, that's when uh, the powerful elites in the Vatican that time, where all the conspiracy was birthed out of, it was falling apart. That's why they had to switch underground. The Catholic Church, which was a public power, switched to a hidden power after that, and that's why it got involved with the conspiratorial elites and etc. Why? Because the public power that time was preached and spread abroad everywhere. I mean, the Catholic Church power and everybody was going into hiding. So that was a it was a spectacular time period evangelism. Uh, I could go on and on for two hours about that, right? Pretty like smart. like like last time, but I'm not going to do that. But know your church history, folks. You got to know your church history. Read the biographies of these great Christian leaders. There's something else. The next part is and some and some pastors and teachers. The gifts that he also provided to the church was also pastors and teachers so notice that order where it goes it goes to pastors and teachers as as last why is that because during that time modernism was growing so the church was becoming apostate so then churches were falling apart becoming apostate that's where we get uh you got to realize that hillsong and calvary chapel these guys are late bloomers Earlier before then, before Joel Osteen, who's the epitome of an apostate preacher that everyone pokes fun at, including even the Calvinist John MacArthur, everyone knows that he's a king of apostasy. But before uh, Joel Osteen, you got these people, uh, Norman Vincent Peale and these guys, long, long time ago. Long, long time ago, Schuler and these guys who were teaching apostasy about the positive thinking, the prosperity gospel, etc. You got Amy Semple McPherson, who was long before Oral Roberts and Benny Hinn, preaching about the prosperity gospel. So the pastors and the churches were falling apart. As a result, then we needed churches who could not, who could not join the modernism movement. Proper music, proper dressing, proper standards were in place. Uh, separation from the world. And then also that there should be a cleanliness within the church, non-compromising with the modernism movement. So that hence was born the fundamentalists. So that's how the independent fundamental Baptist churches were born. The independent Baptist church was birthed from J. Frank Norris. The fundamentalists were, was born when R.A. Torrey combined with a bunch of pastors and laid out the fundamentals of the faith. So then we got the independent Baptists, and then we got the fundamentalists, and then it combined together where it was birthed into the independent fundamental Baptist churches. 
So then you got these big, uh, big famous names in the independent fundamental Baptist movements where you got John R. Rice, who started the Sword of the Lord magazine. You had, uh, believe it or not, some of you didn't know this, but Billy Graham and Jerry Falwell, before they became what they are, they used to be fundamentalists. Yeah. Bob Jones University, before it became what it was, Bob Jones Sr., who was a Methodist, he was part of the fundamentalist movement that time. He was joining the Independent Baptist. Uh, it's pretty funny. The Bible, I mean, I could go on with church history. so interesting. But the Baptist Bible Fellowship, which is, uh, which is commonly called BBF, and you can even look it up at Wikipedia, they're known to be the largest independent Baptist church group, actually, the BBF. Started from uh, John Rawlings and... Uh, yeah, it should have started with Rawlings, but Bucham Vic is another group. John Rawlings and Bucham Vic, they were the guys that started huge independent Baptist church camp. Before Jack Kyles became the 14th largest pastor, it was Bucham Vic and John Rawlings that time. So uh, Dr. Peter S. Ruckman, as you might know from his school that I graduated from, during his time, it was not, listen up now, it was not at a time period of teachers. Look at your verse. It was pastors and teachers, right? And they're like combined together. You know why? During that time, it was more about separation from the modernism movement. So during that time period, they were all about planting churches that time. That's why Hiles was famous about just planting church, church, mega church, mega church, just drawing in huge crowds. So they were pastors that time. But you can tell that because of that emphasis on pastoring churches, they drew away from something that's the very foundation that's important, and that is right doctrine. Amen. That is especially important. So the Bible believers were birthed out of the independent fundamental Baptist movement. What's the difference, Pastor? We just study more Bible than them. Yeah. And that is very plain when you attend any type of independent right. fundamental Baptist church. Right. It is plain as day. You would go, huh, wow, uh, this pastor don't know much about Bible, etc., they would even teach some errors here and there in doctrines. They're the best crowd that we came out from, so we don't want to be too hard on them, but they don't study much Bible. They don't study much Bible. They're typically what you would call a B-grade group. The B-grade is still a pretty good grade, but still it's not that much of an A-grade either. So then, then the Bible believers came in, the A-grade group, you would say, and Dr. Peter S. Ruckman, the genius thing about him is that he took... He was birthed from J. Frank Norris's independent Baptist movement. He graduated from Bob Jones University, which was a fundamentalist movement. Yeah. He preached at conferences for John R. Rice. Sword of the Lord magazine advertised him, believe it or not, yeah. before they kicked him out when he called them out for correcting the King James Bible. Amen. So Dr. Peter S. Ruckman just combined everything together with uh, right doctrine and the independent fundamental Baptist movement. And that's a genius thing about him. And that's where our church was born today. Where do we get the emphasis on street preaching? Soul winning. Where do we get the emphasis on being able to give to missions? And then study so much doctrine. But balance it out where we don't get infatuated with meat. And balance it out where it, where it applies in our devotional life. The blessing is you got to be thankful for these men throughout history. Dr. Upman just combined everything together. And we're just taking in the spoils. And we're building upon it even more. So the reason why we're not uh, hard on J. Frank Norris, Rawlings, and these guys back then is because they're just doing what we're doing right now. Just taking what we learned from our forefathers and continually building it up from there. Amen. As Bible believers grow in more and more knowledge, we're going to advance even more. And we're going to improve more of our own things. So that's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of a Bible-believing movement. Thus, pastors and what? Teachers. It's getting to a point of teachers because churches are getting smaller and don't exist. Yeah. Onliners, you don't have a Bible-believing church, which is sad. So now it's come to a point where you're alone and you're going to have to teach somebody else in your community. That's right. Give them the truth. See, so that's where at that time now. We're at the time of pastors, but it's quickly moving to teachers. That's why it goes and teachers. Why? Because there's still pastors existing. There are still some Bible believers who fellowship with the independent fundamental Baptist churches, 
but it's quickly switching to here. It's switching to here more and more. Why? Because the pastors, which consist of the independent fundamentalist crowd, they're getting corrupt too. Why? Because they're befriending more and more with Calvinists. But I'm not going to get into that. Let's get back. So I talked enough about verse 11. All right, That's your whole church history right there. Yeah. That's your entirety of church history. With this entirety of church history, let me know when I'm out of bounds, how we're progressing more and more over here. And these are the gifts that the Lord has given to us. So we have to hold the fort, teach in right doctrine. That's the last line. Right doctrine is absolutely important because you can only build upon your devotional aspect, soul winning, street preaching, everything, when you know what's right doctrine. So right doctrine is strongly emphasized and I cannot compromise no matter what. Even if it's a very deep, crazy teaching, sorry, if it's from the Bible, I ain't going to take it back. Amen. I can't take it back because it's so important when we have right doctrine. Now in verse 12, this is done for the perfecting of the saints. All of this is done where it can perfect the body of Christ, uh, the church, the saints. We're known as the saints. So being saints ourselves, it, all these gifts is done to perfect us. Now, look at the time period. Remember what I said? Our forefathers laid down the foundations that we're building and improving upon. That's the point. All of this point is about perfection here. It's perfecting us. So before you think that you're smarter than C.I. Schofield and Clarence Larkin, you better watch yourself. These guys didn't have advanced tech like you do typing a word in the Bible yeah. and then you find some verse that matches with your deep new doctrine that you found and you think you're smarter than Larkin and Schofield. No, these guys did not have tech like you did. They just read more Bible than you did. Amen. And they had to memorize and find these verses and write more notes than you did. Amen. You just have these thick Bibles just to show off, that's all. <laughs> you think you're so smart because you already have these reference notes that Schofield laid out for that's you. Right. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. And then you, you like to just build upon it a little more. See, so we don't get to never get, never get prideful from the foundations you laid out. Good men of God laid it out for you. So it perfects us for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. That's important. The Bible-believing work would never, ever have been born had it not been for foundations laid out throughout previous history. I know Martin Luther, he might be anti-Semite, but you got to realize this, that, hey, we would be, still be stuck at the Catholic Church if it weren't for him. He laid the foundation where the Catholic Church power was broken apart. We were able to free ourselves out of that. So he laid down that foundation, and then Schofield laid down dispensationalism for you, and then Ruckman just gathered all the pieces for you, and here you are just eating the spoils, and some of you aren't even using the spoils. So Bible-believing truth would not have been born for the work of the ministry had it not been all these gifts that the Lord gave out to you. One more thing I want to preach, all right? I can't park on verse 11 and 12 forever, but the parking over here is that these are gifts from God. This is not your knowledge. This is not from your hard work and effort. This is not something that, oh, I'm so smart and every Bible believer should look up to me. And then you grow, grow a beard and live up in the mountains and start your own <laughs> internet ministry because you can't even plan a church because no one listens to you. You know what that kind of mentality is? It's a sick, prideful mentality. Arrogance. Filled with arrogance. You've got to watch out for that. So you got to realize these are gifts the Lord gave to you, meaning you don't deserve them. Amen. So what are you doing with the truth you have in your hand? Using that to split the body of Christ, the Bible believers more rather than perfecting them, uniting them. The Lord intend these gifts to perfect and unite us further. Because look at the last part of verse 12. For the edifying of the body of Christ. The church is the body of Jesus Christ. So as the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is intended, it is intended where it should be edified. Did you see that? It's edification, not splitting. The problem uh, with Bible believers is that we know so much Bible, 
So then when we feel like we have some new advanced revelation when you really don't, uh, that's good. then what happens is you try to split even further and critique previous men who are actually gifts, gifts, you corrupt them, you critique them, you scoff them. And then you pretend you have your own gift. And then you split the body of Christ rather than edify. The whole point of all this, where we get to where we're at, is for edification purposes. Yes, it's to edify one another. Edification is to support. It's to support, not split, not ruin. That is extremely important to understand. So, do I advance my knowledge as a Bible-believing teacher? Of course I do. I mean, look at the crazy stuff you see online. I'm, it's pretty much controversial. So, it doesn't stop me from advancing growing knowledge, but you see how I maintain the unity among Bible-believing churches and preachers? I do whatever I can. The evidence is where you see it at our blowout. The evidence is you see it where I tell those people to go to those churches. The evidence is plainly seen. The evidence is plainly seen through that. Now, verse 13, too, we all come in the unity of the faith. That's the point. See, it's supposed to unify us, not split us. Right. Now, notice that all of this perfecting, you keep studying, studying, advancing, advancing, growing, and growing. Why? Until everybody, everybody comes in unity of the faith. So here we are in the faith. Man, our faith is something else. Don't take it for granted being a Bible believer. That is quite a history you have over there. A lot of sacrifices made. So it's until we all can unify together in as Bible believers, then the perfecting process, his gifts are done. Well, look at the apostasy of the church, man. So that means there's still a long way to go. There's a lot of work, which proves that his perfecting process will never be done. His gifts will be continually given all the way till the end, and you better bet your soul on that. So that's a blessing. He'll keep giving you the gifts. He's gifting our church right now, amazingly, with the fruits that we produce. And guess what? He's not going to stop giving gifts. Amen. So remember that, church. Be encouraged. Now look at this. And of the knowledge of the Son of God. Ah, this is important then. So it is in a unity where you're not just unified in the faith, but also filled with the knowledge, knowledge of the Son of God. Now, this is something important. So then you get these weird little sissified Christians who are apostate in wrong doctrine, and maybe even some fundamentalists will pull this up, and then they'll go, oh, so see that right over there? So that means that it, we sh should all unify. Like you said, Pastor, we should unify, we shouldn't split. So these doctrines we shouldn't make such strong emphasis on. We don't need to teach on these things because we got to concentrate on unifying each other, edification. That's a distorted unification and edification. Right. Right. To, do, to have proper unification and edification, you must grow in knowledge right. of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Everything you know about Jesus Christ, even the controversial deep doctrines, you just got to know all of that. To know all of that, then, then the Bible says you have to be unified in the faith and grow in that knowledge. What God wants is a completeness, not just in unity of saved Christians, but a completeness in truth. His knowledge of His Word. But doesn't doctrine split believers? You know what God says about that? Go to Romans 16. This is important. Mm -hmm. We're not the ones splitting when we're teaching right doctrine. They're the ones splitting. Right. The ones who harp on unification, don't make a big deal on doctrine. They already departed from the unity. Right. That's important to understand. Look at Romans chapter 16. If a person does not stand or emphasize right doctrine, they're the ones who separate from unification. Look at Romans chapter 16, verse 17. This is a verse you should mark down yeah. because you're going to get hassled by this from fellow saved Christians who don't know much Bible. Right. Even from pastors. That's important to understand. Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause what? Division. 
Divisions. Divisions on what? And offenses what? Contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. Look at that. God don't consider that splitting. God considered those guys to be the splitters. That's important. All right, go back to Ephesians chapter 4. So this is so important to understand. You see the balance here of Bible-believing truth? The balance is you don't get all heady and high-minded and prideful and arrogant that you suddenly go rogue. But at the same time, there's a balance that you don't get all sissified and you just, let's tolerate each other's uh, differences. And, you know, doctrine is not a big deal. See, there's a, no, this, both sides are not in this unified body of Christ process that the Lord demanded. What God demanded was for a unified body of Christ is that you got to grow in knowledge. And not only that, the idea is it's balanced out with edifying people. Right. Edifying people. Trying to maintain unity as much as possible. Let's look at uh, the last part of verse 13. Unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Okay, so in other words, verse 13, we have to, verse 12, this perfection keeps on growing where it edifies each other. Until when? Until verse 13, we're all unified in this faith. So until Joel Osteen and Calvary Chapel repent of their wicked ways and unify with us Bible believers, then this perfecting process will stop. So they have to join us, not we join them. Right. They call us rogues. They call us ultra-separatists. No, those are the guys. Yeah. They have to join our crowd. Yeah. Until they uh, unify in, our, in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, so that's included in this faith. In this right faith, it's included with full knowledge, right knowledge of Jesus Christ unto what? This fullness reaches unto a perfect point, a perfect man, until you reach the epitome of pretty much manhood, so to speak. But it's in God's eyes because God is a man. The epitome of manhood in what? Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Till you reach the measurement, the measurement lit limit is Jesus Christ's stature. Body of who? Not your body. It's the body of Christ. Yes. It's up to his stature and it's up to his measurement of fullness. Wow. Now, that means then uh, doctrine, studying more and more into doctrine, will go on and on. Yes. Improving your Christian walk will go on and on. See, this improving, perfecting process does not stop somewhere. It keeps on going. Right. It keeps on going. But it, the point is we do it together. And we do it together where we reach this fullness until we're full. And, you know, we sing that song, which is a complete blessing, complete in thee. Me, yeah. Complete in thee. And we think about salvation when we sing that. But you got to realize that also some of the verses are including your practical walk. Right. Your walk in Jesus Christ. So before you sing and shout in that song, you should think twice and carefully about yourself. Do I mean that when I sing it? And that's a small little preaching. All right. It might get a little bit more quiet when we sing that song now. It <laughs> might be more of conviction after that rather than shouting. Now this is extremely important, verse 14. Mark this down. Mark this down for right doctrine. That we henceforth... See, if you're full... Complete in Jesus Christ, right? In your walk with Him, in right doctrine, etc. What happens? Henceforth, be no more children. So you're no longer a child. What, does children, what do children do? They don't know much. They're right. immature in knowledge. Right. They're immature in how to act as proper adults. So you see the problem with these two sides? The problem with these two sides is... One side just knows too much, but then they don't know how to react and socialize and respond to people like proper adults in the real world. Then the other side, they don't make a big deal about knowledge, and they act like immature children dependent upon everybody, where the wind goes, right. where the flow goes. So that's the problem with both sides of the extreme, with arrogant so-called Bible believers and compromisers who compromise with the world and wrong doctrine. So they act like children. And you see that also with 
uh, Bible believers who just study so much, but they don't know about pastoring, dealing with people, real life Amen. situation. Right. They are children. Amen. They're children. Doesn't matter if you know more than the pastor. You're you're just a brainiac who doesn't know where to walk and where to go. There are children like that who exist. There are children. I feel sometimes sorry for these parents, but parents who have really smart children. You ever seen them? Children who know a lot of math, a lot of science, a lot of history, but they don't know real life adult situations. And if they were left out in the real world by themselves, they would not survive. That's a typical uh, zealous Bible believer who's just study studies. Amen. And then becomes arrogant, prideful, and crit critical minded. But look at these children. Tossed to and fro. So they're just tossed to and fro, going around everywhere, cast around going everywhere to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Look at that. So these are people who get carried about with every wind of doctrine that blows. So, for example, you go to YouTube and anything that tosses to and fro where it just comes out in your recommended link and you click on that and you learn doctrine from them and then here comes another wind that blows you click on that one because it's interesting and you learn wrong you learn doctrine from them and then all by that time you listen to a hundred different pastors who are not unified in the faith right. who don't teach right doctrine and you get a mess of a hundred different teachings online tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine right. that's where you don't want to end up in God gave you the church and these are gifts that you rejected to go to the devil's tool, internet. Okay. Internet is built in a way that appeases your flesh. It's a systemized system. That's right. The Lord uses the system some way to give you the truth, but you got to realize this. The intention of YouTube is not to give you truth. The intention of YouTube is to meet wherever your flesh wants to click on. It can be right doctrine, wrong doctrine, or any doctrine that appeals your interest. That's good. Use your heads now. So that's what you got to attend. I keep stressing so many times, onlineers. Go to a Bible-believing church, please. You can't be infatuated in an online world. Amen. You're going to get carried about with every wind of doctrine. Can't get into that. Stick to a Bible-believing church so it's consistent, so it's unified, so that you have just practically one-minded set of right doctrine, not all sorts of different doctrines. Stick to that bunch, stick to that group, and you can grow properly after right, that. Right. Go throughout every place, then you're going to get distorted a bunch of different teachings and you carry it about with every wind of doctrine. So you need to attend a Bible-believing church. And if you don't have a Bible-believing church to attend to, then you have our church online. And we recommended some Bible-believing church channels to you as well. So you got to listen to that bunch. Don't pick a pastor of your preference that has a lot of subscribers and appeals on subjects that you like to hear. Amen. Sometimes a Bible-believing pastor would teach on a subject like fruits of the Spirit, and you go, oh, I already know, and I'm not interested in that. No, you don't know. Amen. You don't understand, child. You don't. Every child, what do they think? I'm a big boy now. Yeah. I can do what big brother does, my big sister does. Why can't I do it, mommy, daddy? Mommy, daddy, I can do what you do. Yeah. I can eat that food next. Yeah, you see that? On, That's a child's yeah. mentality. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. You think you're grown adults. You're independent-minded people, and you yeah. know what. You're big boy, big girls, and you can know what to do. No, you don't. You're children. So God realizes that he has to give you gifts uh -huh. where a, where a Bible-believing ministry can help you grow. Right. It's important to do that. Yeah, yeah. By, the slate of, by the slate of men. So notice that the last part of verse 4, uh, the next part of verse 14, by the slate of men. So it's like the slate of hand. Right. You get that idea? So that brother knows what I'm talking about, you know, because he's so spiritual. So he knows what I'm talking about, the slate of hand. So... That part is done what? It's done for tricking. Yeah. It's done for tricking. Right. That's what these uh, doctrines do. These doctrines that where the wind blows, it's done to trick you. Right. That's the cunning craftiness of Satan. Where it follows and cunning craftiness. Uh -huh. See that? 
So it's like in uh, where you hear the sleight of hand with card tricks. It's all about cunning craftiness. Right. It's to deceive you. Yes. It's crafty. Make you look at something where you shouldn't be looking at. Ah, Whereby they lie in wait to deceive. It's done where it's hidden and it's waiting for you to click on that video because he keeps saying recommended watch, recommended watch, and it's lying in wait for you, just waiting for you just to click on that button so that it can deceive you. That's why you don't believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. That's why you get so panic mode and then you think that where we're heading toward with these vaccines and where the government is going, that we are entering the Antichrist era. I'm in danger of taking the mark of the beast. That's why you get into that stuff. Right. You get so messed up in wrong doctrine. Why? Because it's lying in wait to deceive. And then you just click on that bunch. You're tossed every, uh, like the wind. Anything that goes pops out to you. That's why God gave you gifts. Verse 11, are you abiding by these gifts? If you're not abiding by those gifts at verse 11, then you're, you will be verse 14. Right. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Now, you're not smarter than the Bible. I trust the Bible more than you. The Bible says if you don't do verse 11 through 13, what happens consequence? You become a child tossed to and fro. Yeah. Every wind of doctrine. All right, verse 15 but speaking the truth in love. So it is important that when you speak God's truth, that it is done in love. Now, this is the problem with a lot of people, is that when you get into Bible-believing truth, that you think that when you give out Bible-believing truth to your loved one and family member, and look, we're all guilty of this, because we just learn Bible-believing truth, right? So then what happens when you witness to your loved one? You're going to burn in hell if you don't get saved. That's like the first thing that you shoot off of your mouth, right? <laughs> which is not a smart move. Which is not a smart move. But I can understand. A lot of you, uh, a lot of my members uh, used to be Catholic, and they just hate the Catholic Church. They get Amen. angry because Amen. they lived in deception and lies for so many years. So they just can't wait that the Pope gets his behind kick. Amen. And, then they'll just, and then they'll just tell their family, you know, Mom, Dad... Those, those priests and those Roman Catholic <laughs> rulers, they're just pedophiles. They're corrupt Amen. rulers. I don't know why you go to that priest. He's probably a pedophile too. Amen. And then the, the mom and the dad gets offended. And they're like, yeah. I knew this priest for 35 years. Mm -hmm. And they helped me with a lot of problems and issues. Yeah. And then they get really mad at you. And you get really mad at them. Amen. And then you're like, how am I going to get you saved? Well, that's not how it's going to work. Right. It's got to be done in love. Amen, brother. Amen. You know what? Well, this is what atheists hate. They hate this tactic. That's why they live so much in hate. The tactic that works the most that atheists hate a lot, that's why they build up so much hatred even more against Christians, is that you give them the truth in love. Exactly. A family can't argue against you when you tell them about hellfire, about salvation, that salvation is not by works, when they, when they see that you really care for them. Amen, preacher. That's good. Look, Mom, Dad, I don't want you burn in hell forever. I want to see you get saved. That's why they... Look, Mom and Dad will get torn up about that, don't you think? That will give them a guilty conscience. That'll help that'll make them go through sleepless nights. Is that they see your heart for them when you give them the truth. And that ruins them. So... When we do street preaching visitation, praise the Lord, we always had a good testimony so far. I mean, for crying out loud, we still, this is amazing, man. We can, and I can even say this online because I read all the legal rules, but we can just preach outside. Amen. We can, and we had cop cars pass by us numerous times, Amen. even under the mandatory restrictions and et cetera. Praise I mean, what freedom and what opportunity? Why? Because they know we're not hate-filled people. Right, yeah. right. We do this because we care for their souls. Amen. They see us talking to people. Visitation too. So speaking the truth in love. But uh, it's these street preachers that are getting the headline news. The ones that are jerks. Mm -hmm. The ones that are trying to kick every sin out there and that's all they focus on. Yeah. They don't focus about how to get them safe from hell. 
When you point out sin and hellfire, it's done to lead them to salvation, not to kick them away from salvation. There's a huge difference with that. Soul winning too, being a testimony to your family members. And yes, even in church too, in church, it is not all the time where you always preach sarcastically and criticize false preachers and wrong doctrine. All, even when you do that, something's, uh, you got to ask yourself this, do you love? Do you have love in your heart? Do you care? If a preacher does not have love in his heart when he preaches the word of God, then whether sarcasm or being nice, you're still preaching and teaching wrong. So wait a minute, then that means, Pastor, you're saying that um, when I speak the truth in love, you're saying that even if you're criticizing wrong doctrine, being sarcastic false prophets, as long as you have love inside you, then it's not unloving when you criticize and be sarcastic of them? Absolutely. You might say, I, the, the, it sounds like a contradiction. No, it doesn't, because look at this one. Mm -hmm. Speak the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things. So when you speak the truth in love, you're growing in Christ in everything that he does. Now, what does God do, right? I'll tell you what. You read that Bible? He's sarcastic. Oh, he criticizes heavily. Worse than me. <laughs> Worse than me. I mean, God, I mean, if you're going to grow up in him in all things, you have to speak the truth in love as much as God would do it. You have to follow his example. So what is God's example? Keep reading. Grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So the head, you have to look at the head, Jesus Christ. Follow his example of speaking the truth in love. What is Jesus' example speaking the truth in love? Yeah. As many as I love, I rebuke yeah. and chasten. And chasten, if you look at Hebrews 12, is like scourging. Did Jesus scourge? Did you look at the temple? Yeah. Yeah. Talk about love, man. <laughs> you think that I have no love? Thank God I did not beat Joe, uh, Joel Osteen's behind with a whip. If I did that, I would even think I'm in the wrong. But think about that. Jesus did that. Why did Jesus do that? Because there are several things here you got to understand. Does that mean he had no love? No, he had love. Because one, if you have true, real love, that means you have to hate something. If you really love the truth, you must hate lies. Okay. You know what gets me uh, angry and I kick them really hard and I go in sarcasm mode? It's when, when you criticize the truth in that book and you act like some kind of elitist scholar having all the truth and other people don't have the truth. You disgust me. I'll keep yeah. poking fun at you and talk angry at you and I don't care. I could care less. I disrespect scholars, period. I disrespect scholars. People have to go through education, school, pay, what? Thousands of dollars to attain the knowledge and the truth that they have? Whether it's Christian school or even an unbelieving school, until you get a PhD level, then you have the authority to talk? You shut up, man. Soak your head in a bucket and pull it out twice. You disgust me. Before I get into angry mode, so you, it shows an anger and a hatred of something wrong. That's one. Number two, Jesus may have beaten people, but you don't see that. You don't see that twenty four seven. Yeah. If you keep reading about unification here at Ephesians four, did you? Re they didn't read verse twenty six. Yeah. We'll get to there later. But look at verse twenty six. Yeah. Be angry and what? Sin not. Sin not. Amen. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So yeah, there should be anger. Onliners, because their children toss to and fro. They don't know much about Bible-believing truth. They see me get angry. They see me sarcastic, criticizing. They say, careful, Brother Kim. Yeah. Don't let your anger get into you. You got to speak the truth in love. When they keep saying that, they don't read verse 26 by context. Yeah. They didn't finish reading verse 15. You got to follow Christ's example. Yeah. They don't know what they're talking about. Why? Because their children toss to and fro. They haven't grown. Yeah. Grown adults do get angry when some kind of pedophile touches their child. Amen. Right, 
something touches and ruins God's flock, you betcha someone someone corrupts that. I'm going to I'm going to go land on you on all fours, yeah. no mercy. Bam. Amen, brother. Amen, bro. That's what happens with real love, real care. You know, the, I, I have to let me park this one last time. Yeah, on. You know why I kick pre, uh, false preachers more than any other person? More than any other person? You know why I think the number one enemy is actually the evangelical Christian church, not even the Catholic church? You know why I call them out? Because it is these people who should know better, yeah. who have the word of God in their hands, who know the fundamentals of the faith, and they allow corruption to enter inside their own flock. And if they never did that, then this, wouldn't, this apostasy would have never happened. So I kick your behinds all the way till the rapture. All the way. And I do it with a smile. Amen, bro. Makes me stinking angry. You corrupt the next generation. Why do you think your next generation mess up in college? Become atheists. You know why? Because they're brainwashed to think that church is all about a pastor being nice. And they don't hear truth. They don't hear what's right and what's wrong. And you don't inform them, you don't equip your members either to grow in that knowledge. No wonder they get brainwashed by their professors. School. Shame on you. Anyway, returning to the main text. So, it is so important that we follow Christ's example. So he was angry, but he didn't sin. And when, look at this, remember what I said before too, it's not 24-7 the anger. Verse 26, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. There's an anger and a hatred to sin, but this is not 24-7, man. If you live like that, then your life is not filled with love. It's hate. It's hate and anger. You got to watch yourself. Think about this. Jesus Christ was angry. He beat people. He called people different names. He called Herod that fox. He called Sadducees and Pharisees vipers and fool. He called some of some people fools. But you got to realize this. What did Jesus do to the same people who crucified him? The same people who he preached against. Father, forgive them, yeah. for they know not what they do. Can you do that? Can you do that to some sodomite who spits at you? Can you do that to some atheist and liberal who uh, makes fun and pokes fun at you? So see where your wrath lies. Your wrath, does it come from because of something right or is it fleshly motivation? Anger responds to anger very well. If anger responds to anger, you better make sure that it's done in the right way. Is it because of truth? Is it because of faith? Also, do you really love them? Oh, that's good. That's good. All right. Back to the main text. So you see, this is a great balance. And then thus we ended off at verse 16. From, who, from whom, so from whom Jesus Christ, we grow in that kind of love. We attain that way. That's why we have to study Bible-believing truth. We have to grow in that. From whom Jesus Christ, the whole, bodily, whole body, so the whole body of Jesus Christ, fitly joined together. So it fits well. When it joins together, because each joining, all right, each member joins together, they're different parts, but it fits well. Look, uh, my hand fits well with my body. If I get a bigger hand, then for crying out loud, I'll be hunchback probably like this. And then I'll prove evolution, you know, I'll be the next fossil that they'll dig up. So the thing is, is that this hand, the way that it's, even though it's totally different from me, it's built in a way where it fits my body just right. And compacted by that which every joint supplieth. So every single joint that supplies, it compacts and fits well together, the whole body. The joint supplies it. According to the effect, effectual working, so it's effectual, it works very well. Despite of its differences, it fits well, it's effectual, notice, according to the effectual working, so it works effectively, 
in the measure of every part, in its own, own, own measurement. Remember the context of the gifts? Right. Mm. Everyone has their own measurement. Why? It's so that the body of Christ can stay intact. One measurement is too high or too small, then it can't fit together. We grow together. We grow together. So you got to realize this, is that some brethren may be more feeble than you, some brethren may be smaller in growth than you, or totally different from you. And that's why Romans 14 says there are different convictions. They even have different convictions. But the point of all this is where we fit together. You know why one person will have a different conviction from you? So that your conviction don't go out of bounds. So the person with a different conviction can keep you in a balance. And you did the same thing with the other person. That's the beauty of a Bible-believing church. I mean, that's how I keep to where I am totally balanced. You know why? I have to totally different preachers with different convictions. And everybody else keeps me in the balance where I'm at. Our church members too. I mean, like I told you before, everyone cannot be Gene Kim. You get paranoid freaks and everybody cannot be Robert Randall. It'll be a circus sideshow. Yeah. Everybody is their different measurements. Why? So that we can fit together. If there's one thing that I can't thank God enough too many times is for my church. Our church is totally unique, especially if you look back at the beginning. And only the people who would probably be with me at the beginning stages would know that. We came a long way, and I'm, I mean, the Lord truly blessed our church. We have really good people. I mean, different people. Sure, there are some problems here and there, but man, I got really good people. And I can't ask for a better church. You got to realize is this is a small kind of church where we're tackling the world together online where we were able to have a revival meeting under impossible situations where other churches were dependent on us and where Bible believers around the world look up to us. This is not to say I'm the greatest preacher or that we're the greatest church in the world. It's more so of God's gift yes. of what he gave to us right. that you should be doing with your own church as well and onliners when you're by yourselves, be very grateful for what God has given to you. And you can't ask for anything better. It does what? In the measure of every part, every part has their own measurement, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself. So notice over here, it increases the body of Christ. So the body of Christ doesn't stop. Your own measurement keeps it growing. So there are more souls that need to get saved and become Bible believers. That's good. We need to grow even more and more and more. And it edifies the body itself see so then your own knowledge your own convictions should not stumble the brethren where it uh, stumbles the body parts it should keep it in compact and growing together you sometimes have to go down to their level and when you go down to their level you shouldn't stay down in their level you gotta go down to their level and go up you gotta keep going up with them and this is all done in what love Love. So all of this is done because the foundation is love. Do you forget that whole chapter of Ephesians 3 and 4? Did you forget that? The pinnacle foundation of everything you do, even Bible-believing truth, is love. Love is the very first thing. The church of Ephesus in Revelation 2, typical Bible believers, everything right, practice doctrine, but they left out the very first foundation, and that's love. Jesus, I showed you these verses. Jesus said to fulfill the whole law is done in just one word, and that's loving God with all your heart and soul and mind and your neighbor as yourself. When you do these two things, Jesus said it hangs all the law on the prophets. Right, right. You know why our church survived all this time? Because we really love God and each other. And it doesn't matter how many imperfections or problems we have. As long as you love God, here's the encouraging thought. You ready for this? For some of you who feel so far behind, for some of you who are struggling with the same sins, get ready for this. As long as somewhere in your heart you love God and you love the brethren, there's always hope for you. Yes. And I've seen changes, yes. no matter Amen, how far brother. behind you are. Praise the Lord. Okay, so let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that today's teachings have been a blessing to the hearers and help us to increase our knowledge of the scriptures and our edification as the body of Christ. 
and the body of Christ, it includes all saved believers. It's not just Bible believers, it includes all saved believers. But this body of Christ consists of Bible-believing truth. That's the point. And so many joints are out of place, and those consist of saved Christians who are apostate, who are not of Bible-believing truth. So I pray, Heavenly Father, that they'll be unified with us, and we'll keep doing our part kicking wrong doctrine, showing Bible-believing truth, so that we can get the joints back in place, and that we always remember our foundation in love, and not built upon wrath and hate. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.